So it's a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, you know, I, I live in Zurich, and I've been, I lived before that in Basel, but I am from Germany originally. So if I speak about Switzerland today, I use my Swiss passport, which I have now, uh, since the last five years, so don't, don't confuse the two things. Uh, another thing I learned in America, of course, is to speak very quickly. Uh, because in America, if you don't speak quickly, people leave. So if I speak too quickly, please just wave your hands, okay? So I'm here today to talk about an uh, interesting topic of technology and humanity. You know, I wrote this book, uh, which, by the way, is coming out in, in French now in uh, about two months. And it's already out in German uh, two weeks ago. So you can go to Amazon and, you know, do, do what you have to do. But I wrote the book... Because uh, I didn't, you know, I'm, I've, I've written five books, but I'm not much of a writer. But at every uh, event I speak at the last five years, people ask me a simple question. I do about 100 speeches a year, you know. So people ask me a question, what is going to happen to people right, now that everything is becoming technology? Right? And that's actually quite true. Uh, today, voice recognition is just about perfect, so the machine can speak to us and we can speak to the machine. We have self-driving cars, we have holographic displays, and we can see the future in 10 years is going to be so different, it's hard to imagine. I think most of that is good, don't get me wrong. But the kids of my kids, for example, will never know how to drive a car because they just speak to a box that it shows up. They definitely won't know what a CD is or a DVD. Maybe they'll know what a book is. A lot of kids are already refusing to learn languages because they can speak to their mobile app and translate right? it. Uh, I was in Tokyo a couple of months ago and I had a half-hour conversation in Japanese with a sushi chef right? using a mobile app called Say Hi. Right? And it works perfectly. The guy speaks in Japanese, comes out in German. Uh, it's like a you know, perfect thing for relationships with people there where you don't speak the common language, I suppose. Right? But this is really what's happening to our world today, right? We're, we're becoming fully digitized. I mean, it's, the, the interesting thing is that this is not about the things that we have achieved in the past, like the printing press or the internet or nuclear power, right? This is actually changing us. Right? Technology is going inside of us. Right? right now, I use a mobile phone. That's my external brain. But this brain is going to move onto my eyeglasses, holograms, neural connection. How far away is that? It's entirely possible, right? Brain-computer interface. Some of you are probably working on that. It's a little bit science fiction, but it's not impossible. So my job is to do this, is to listen. You know, I don't predict the future. I, I listen to the future. That's really quite different. There are people who were great predictors, like Alvin Toffler, Arthur C. Clarke, you know, they are the, the Jimi Hendrix of futurism. That's not me. And then I have good news, and I have some bad news. But I'm mostly an optimist about the future. I think the future is better than we think. It's very important to realize, you know, today, uh, for obvious reasons, Trump, Erdogan, and others, people are worried about the future. They're worried not... Is this working, or what, do we have some issues here? Okay, well, we can replace it if you wish. Um, anyway, so people are worried about the future. Right? They're worried about my job, automation, robots, you know, Hollywood movies. Yeah. So everywhere I go, people are saying, you know, what's, what's going to happen with my kids? Will they have a job? Right? Will robots take their work? So there's some things I'll talk about. And basically, I'll start with this. You've seen the exponential curve. Of course, that's an old hat, you know, Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, and so on. But here's the important part our position in this curve. We're at the pivot point. Right? We're actually at the point of where it actually becomes true. You know, transistors and, and CPUs won't get much smaller than a nanometer. But everything else is exponential, you know, quantum computing, 3D computing. Many other things I worked out right here in Switzerland are being invented. We're at the point to where everything that used to be science fiction, just about everything, is becoming science fact. I should talk to you about science, right? I mean, you're scientists, obviously, many of you, but I'm not. I'm just a, a, a lonely musician for my training. But, you know, really what's happening is today we're seeing stuff like exponential connectivity, exponential data, the Internet of Things, smart everything, right? smart city, smart farming, even smart banking, right? Uh, intelligent machines, 
Every company has a major initiative about what's called cognitive computing. Machines that can think. Now, you perceive this to be kind of a joke, right? Because how can a machine think, right? Can a machine really be intelligent? Well, it is definitely becoming intelligent, but not like we are. So this is a, a whole stretch of changes. It's all happening. The end of oil is a certainty. This is not a, just a, this is not a question of, of uh, geopolitics. Right? It's basically no longer going to be affordable when we have renewable energy. 20 years. I spoke the other day at an event in Dubai, and right before I spoke was the, the ruler of Dubai. You can tell by the title that he's important. Uh, the ruler of Dubai, he said, he's going to look forward to the day where the last oil comes out of the sand. This is Dubai. Right? I don't know what they're going to do, maybe golf or something, but the end of oil is a certainty. Right? And then we're going to have maybe a, a different economic system. We voted last year no on the guaranteed minimum income, right? the Grundeinkommen, yeah? but sustainable capitalism, what is that? Right? Is that really socialism? It's the singularity? Singularity is a point in time when computers have the same processing power than us and quickly become infinite in their power. There's lots of calculations about this, roughly 10 years, some people say, seven years, eight years, in my lifetime, I hope. This is not something that's out of, this is the point in time when machines can do things that we used to think of as human. So there's a sort of a map of things, you can download the PDF later, on my website, futurewithgarrett.com. But really what's happening is that we're looking at the end of business as usual. This is very important for you, since you're researchers and thinking about IT infrastructure. Almost nothing that we used to do is going to be the same. Music is on Spotify, movies are on Netflix, cars are on Uber, banks are going digital, the blockchain is going to take over distribution and contract and insurance, everything basically. We're going to have self-driving cars, probably not like we think, but you know, this is good enough. We're going to have hotels that are automated. This is the first hotel in New York called the Yotel. It's completely automated. So there's nobody at reception. I guess it's a great way to save labor costs. I wouldn't find that very exciting, but they do, obviously. And there's Michael Jackson performing in Las Vegas as a hologram. I mean, you have to watch the video of this show. You could not tell that it's not Michael Jackson. Right? I mean, at least not from the camera. Probably you could tell when you're in front of the stage. Right? So next time you go to a business meeting, this costs about $3 million to set up, so expensive. But in five years, you go to the Zurich airport and you jump into a hologram to go to a meeting in Singapore. And you'll buy a ticket from Swiss. Right? That, that would be a good business model for Swiss and maybe for Lufthansa because they wouldn't need any pilots for that. So, blockchain, right? That's another one of those examples. Among futurists, we have a saying from Paul Sappho who said, we should not mistake a clear view for a short distance. Right? Blockchain is a certainty, but it's not going to happen next year. I mean, the things we're seeing today, shipping, logistics, insurances, blockchain is going to be as certain as the internet per se. Right? Well, it will take a while for that to shake out. Right? So we, we do have time to consider where this is going. Speaking to machines like we speak to friends. This is happening right now. This is a huge shift. Uh, if you know kids that are already doing this, about 35% of kids are already speaking with their computers by voice command. Right? We're about a year and a half away from utter perfection of voice recognition, you know, natural language processing, and in different languages. And reverse, the machine can speak like you or like your wife or husband. Uh, in fact, now there's the first project that will make it so that you can speak to your husband or your wife after they die right, using a computer. That's extremely useful, I think. But, but here's an example. Alexa, dim the lights. Alexa, play happy birthday. Happy birthday, Freddy. You know this box, Amazon Echo, right? Uh, uh, Alexa, uh, this is a very interesting box. You, you should try one once. You know, it's basically you speak to a box and it can order things for you or tell you the weather or go to your bank account. Right? It's, it's essentially voice control, the oh. new kind of interface. Right? So everything we're doing, I use the cows because we're in Switzerland. Right? 
the, the cows are being connected in Switzerland, did you know that? They're, they're getting connected with an orphit and they can go and give milk any time of the day or night by themselves. So for a farmer, no more milking. If you have 100,000 Swiss francs, you, the cow can make its own way for milking. Right? But it's a global hyperconnectivity. We're talking about a terabyte per second right? in the next 10 years. We're talking about connectivity like you just can't believe, basically like water, right? like air. Offline will become a mental state. Okay? The cloud, no problem. It's actually good, you know, I, I tried to uh, convince a major chain of Swiss hotels the other day uh, to introduce the slogan of offline is the new luxury. Because right? I think that will sell. You know. Come to Switzerland, be bored. You know. So, but here's a question. What should not be connected? It is not human to be constantly connected, right? Because we are not a machine. There's a, a slight difference here, right? If we are to constantly connect, it's like, it's like uh, doing drugs all day long for the next five years. You know, we are on this huge drug of connectivity. And it's okay to do it, but it's not natural for us in the sense of constantly connecting to a huge flow of information without any contemplation, right? without being in the moment. All you have to do is go to Southeast Asia and have dinner in a restaurant, and you'll see every single family working on at least two iPads and tablets at the same time. Uh, and, and having conversations with guys in Vladivostok or whatever, but not talking to each other. We wouldn't do that here. That would be socially not acceptable, but... Uh, or maybe we would. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, I've proposed to the European Commission, and they, have this, they are discussing is right, the right to disconnect. We're going to need this, the right to disconnect. In the US, they're already saying you're either wired or you're fired. We don't want to live in that world because it basically means that we are useless if we're not hyper-connected. Right? How far should we draw the line? I mean, the current things about social media, this is an utter disgrace, right? Facebook, Twitter, changing the outcome of an election by being used, right? I mean, that's a bad idea. Right? Right? We're going to live in a world where we're completely surrounded by technology. And it's kind of weird, you know, everybody who, who's not connected and there's about three and a half billion people around the world, they want nothing more than to be connected. And everybody that's really connected wants to be nothing more than being disconnected. So there must be some sort of balance, right? We have to figure out, you know, can we live in this world of constant notifications? Right? I call this the sofalarity, not the singularity, right? to where we don't do anything. We, we just, technology brings everything to us, right? including our dates, our food, you know. So the, these game changes that we see in front of us, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, and human genome editing, those are the three things that will change our world dramatically. And that work is being done right here in Switzerland. Thankfully. Not that we have a real industry for that, you know, that all goes, as soon as you're good in any of these, you get hired in China, you know, or in Silicon Valley. Right? But we do have a lot of science there. Right? It's very interesting. I mean, that's, you know, McKinsey calls this roughly a $60 trillion economy. It's hard to say what human genome editing will do in that future and on who's going to pay for it. I mean, clearly, it brings up huge ethical problems. If we're going to beat cancer, and we will, this is not 200 years away. I won't, I'll be too old, I think, for that. Thankfully, I'm not afflicted. But say, you know, 25, 30 years, Diabetes, before that. Alzheimer's, before that. Because there's many technology solutions. How do we charge people for that? Is it impossible? I mean, imagine if we have a cure for cancer, don't we have to give it away? But it will cost 50 trillion Swiss francs to create this cure, right? Things have all kinds of issues and, you know, an arms race, right? We're facing a digital arms race already, and that is China and the U.S. The posturing is unbelievable. It's exactly like Cold War. We'll be the first ones to create AI, you know, to rule the world. That we don't want. A nuclear arms race is very difficult. It takes a lot to make a bomb, as you can see in Iran or in North Korea, which we're struggling with, right? But then we have, you know, our good friend Putin, 
says that the first nation that leads in AI will be the ruler of the world. That's going to be Switzerland, right? No, just... Uh, but well, saying that as a German would be a bad joke, but... Uh, Beijing, right, says the same thing. They want to rule the world with AI. We must really think about how we're going to balance these weapons. Because technology can always be used good and bad, right? The te technology just exists. It's not morally anything. I mean, I can use technology for the best things and I can use it to kill people. I can make a super soldier using DNA editing or I can heal cancer. The only thing that keeps me from doing that is rules, regulations, social contracts, ethics, laws, peer pressure. So that's something we have to look at, you know, because technology is what I call hell then, you know, hell and heaven. Okay? And I'm sure you work in a technology, you know what I'm talking about. So that means we have to be careful that, you know, that we don't reach what's called the Oppenheimer syndrome, you know, which is the, one of the co-inventors of the bomb, uh, that after a few days after Hiroshima, he said that he had, he had created hell. Right? We don't want to get there to that point because technology has no ethics, right? And it shouldn't. It's up to us to have ethics. I mean, if we don't have ethics, we die. Right? Human society without ethics has happened once or twice, right? Died. Rome and Germany. So that's very important for us because really what happens in our lives is really this, right? This is what rules our lives. It's what are called the algorithms, the human things, right? not the algorithms. And that's how we decide everything. That's how we talk to each other, and in less than 0.4 seconds, we can estimate the other person without saying a, th a single thing. A computer that observes me for four years, right? there was a great article about this yesterday, right? a woman said that you know, she looked at her Google data, and Google thought, after four years of observing, that she was a man. Right? That's how good the computer got her. Right? Technology is not what we seek, but how we seek. It's a very important message. We shouldn't confuse the, the tool, you know, it, it, this is a hammer, basically, right? I mean, we don't live to be a hammer. Right? We use the hammer. And so, this is very important because this is going to happen to us when technology will change, humanity will change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. If you think I'm overestimating, I'm not. If you're scientists, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, the, the things we're seeing in nanotechnology, right? uh, uh, material sciences, energy, batteries. Uh, you could say, well, it's always been very fast, but it's like, it's, I mean, if you're tracking these trends, it all goes like this. Right? It all goes exponential. The conversions of man and machine is years, not decades. In, in the sense of capabilities, not in the practical sense, right? In the, you know, brain-computer interfaces and those kind of things. That brings up all kinds of ethical issues. If I have this tool of a brain-computer interface, I can be superhuman. I can be God, so to speak, if you wish. Would I then never want to return? I mean, imagine for a minute if you're a doctor and you have a virtual reality headset and you can, you can make your rounds using the data from Microsoft HoloLens. Would you want to take it off in the evening? That's unlikely. Because right? you're, you're going from a superman to just a man. Right? Ray Kurzweil says we're going to live forever. Companies in Silicon Valley, 84 companies who have the mantra of saying that death is a disease. Right? The end of dying. I don't think it would start companies like this here in Switzerland, but, you know, 70 is the new 50, 90 could be the new 60. Imagine what that will do to our pension system. Right? It's unbelievable. I mean, the kids of my kids, again, they'll, they'll be 100 years for sure, unless they're stupid, right? which they could be. Right? But, I mean, think about that for a second, right? We're going to retire with 64, and then what, 60 years of cruise ship? Yeah. I don't know. Today we have the first drug called Cimbria, right, from Novartis, right here in Switzerland. Right? The Cimbria drug is FTC approved okay, for leukemia. It's the first genome therapy for leukemia. 
going on the market for $475,000. Now, this drug can be a very likely, if you are at that point where you take this drug, most of people die that take this drug. So it's, it's far away from, from being a real problem. But if it, if it is actually a solution for leukemia, could you charge half a million dollars for that? That strikes me as quite unjust. Right? I mean, never mind your AIDS medication that costs you $80 a month. Lots of people die because they can't afford that. Right? So what's that going to do for Novartis? You know, is, there, is there going to be a solution for this? We're heading to a world that quickly moves uh, computer power to the point where our human intelligence is slightly improving, at, at least for some of us, uh, but the machine intelligence becomes virtually unlimited. You know, exponential curve, uh, if you go 30 times from four, you're at over one billion. That's straight into the sky. Right? And even if the most conservative estimates, 50 years for that to happen. That one billion. So estimates, this is from my colleague Ray Kurzweil, who says, I don't agree with Ray on most things, but on this one I agree. In 2050, the first computer has a capacity of all human brains. And this doesn't mean anything about social or emotional or any of those things, obviously. Yeah? Computational. And there's no way we're going to do without them. Right? Solving climate change, solving global warming, right? solving energy, water, food, medicine. The question is no longer going to be very soon if technology can do something. We're still asking that question today, right? Can we do this? How, does it actually work? Yeah. Can I connect to the cloud? How much does it cost? The question is useless because in a few years, the question is only going to be why are we doing this? What is the purpose? Because we can literally do everything, anything. Is our government prepared for this? They're talking about copyright laws, right? And things like that. And why it's illegal to download music. Yeah. The key question is really why and who? Right? Who is mission control for humanity? It's not us here, I can tell you that. I lived for 17 years in Silicon Valley. It's mission control as in Silicon Valley. Right? 95% of all data, of all invention, of all innovation, Silicon Valley, and then now China. And they're racing to be that. We need to stand up for what we want. Not just in Switzerland, but in Europe. You know, we have our own... I mean, Switzerland is a great example for the collective benefit idea. Right? That's, that's what we're discussing here. Right? That's why we have a direct democracy. This concept is virtually unknown in the US. Right? Collective benefit? No. That's far-fetched, right? Do we need something like an environmental protection agency for humans? I mean, think about all the things that make us human, right? Inefficiency, storytelling, mistakes, right? lying. Right? I mean, we are we're the worst machines in the universe, right? I mean, do we want to give that away to become a better machine? I mean, that strikes me as a crazy idea. So forget the EPA, which is virtually dead anyway, thanks to Donald. Let's have a humanity protection agency. I propose to start that right here in Switzerland. Maybe it's part of the United Nations, I don't know, but keep hearing that. But because this is our challenge, right? You may not realize this, because when you're in it, you don't really see what's happening. But I mean, clearly, we're going to only marginally improve as humans in our processing power. Yeah, we get older, but... I'm not going to memorize Wikipedia. I tried. Yeah. IBM Watson reads 1.2 million books a minute. IBM Watson Medical Cloud reads all oncology reports, 4,250 every week. A doctor can't even read one because he's too busy. So machines are going to you know, go there and just blow us out of the water. Because now data is in the oil, new oil, and AI is the electricity of, this, of society. Data companies are the most powerful companies in the world, and they're ruling everything. Forget the banks, sorry, Switzerland. Forget the oil companies, sorry, ruler of Dubai. This is really what's happening, is data interfaces. Great video from Hitachi, where there they, they show why data is so... You can mess. see this on YouTube, right? 
That's why he it's really entertaining how Hitachi data. talks about how data is the Elevators currency of life. <laughs> uh, and is, you can find thousands of these kind of videos uh, adoring technology. And it's actually pretty well made, makes a good case. Right? But then we have to think about do we really understand what's happening? Right? Everything in the cloud, everything connected. And I would maintain this 90% benefit, right? If I can put my data in the health cloud, I will. But it has to be secure and it has to be controlled. We're not just going to do that just because we can. Well, we'll have to find a compromise there. I mean, this is a huge, I call this a $50 trillion temptation. Right? I mean, Google has a, probably some of you are working on this, right? Google has a project called the, the, uh, the Google Brain. The UP Commission has a, a, a digital brain project. Look at the power of tech companies. I mean, forget oil and banking, they are dwarves compared to these guys. And there's 50, the rest are Chinese companies, 14.4 trillion, just the Internet of Things. The economic power of technology is bigger than anything we've seen, including nuclear power. The problems that we're seeing today with nuclear energy and nuclear bombs, they are very small compared to the problems that we may have with artificial intelligence and genomic engineering. They're just not quite here yet. Google was fined 2.4 billion euros for acting, according to the commission. Uh, Google is one of my clients, so I'm going to be careful about what I say here. But because they were acting, what they say, unfair and illegal under U.S. under European law, by changing the shopping paradigm, the shopping mechanism, the algorithm. Right? There's going to be hundreds of these cases. And I don't propose that we should always just have fines, but I mean, clearly, uh, if you're looking at the roadmap of where things are happening, okay. right, you have up here Berlin, Tel Aviv, uh, this is uh, Lisbon, uh, what is this, Barcelona, and of course Singapore, right? What about us? Could Switzerland take a leadership role in what I call digital ethics? You know, the future of society based on technology. Our society will be based on technology. There's, there's no way back. Right? I mean, we can go to the most elaborate mountain cave, you know, we can't get away. Are we going to pursue this? I mean, when you think this through, 40-60% of jobs are going to be automated, lots of new jobs will be created, but ultimately, technology makes things abundant, right? Films, music, banking, driving, transportation, right? abundant, cheaper, easy to provide. That's pretty much the end of the economic capitalist system as we know it. Right? What does consumption mean in a world where everything is available? So that's only 20 years away. I think we could take leadership there. We can move towards a world where our next colleagues are machines. And I don't mean to say that we're not going to be part of this. We will be, in the sense that we're not going to be superfluous just because there's a machine. And by the way, machines could never do this particular job here. Right? I mean, they could fall down, it wouldn't be a problem, but this is actually a very hard job to do, because it's not routine. But here's the bottom line. Anything that can be digitized or automated will be, including science. There's a field called cloud biology that puts the science lab into the cloud and simulates the experiment to get to some supposedly similar results. Is that going to make us, as the book Homo Deus says, that's the second book you should read after mine, uh, he says we're going to all become useless humans. I don't think so. I think we have a lot more potential than that. You know, my, my theory is that anything that cannot be digitized or automated will become much more valuable. And that's all the human things. It's our creativity, design, imagination. You know, Einstein already said imagination is more important than knowledge. And I wonder about that when I look at our education of our kids, right? I mean, most schools are teaching our kids to be a robot, basically. Our kids have to be the opposite of a robot if they're going to live in that world, because the robots do this, right? The robots will be pretty damn good. They're going to replace bookkeepers and drivers and researchers and financial analysts and maybe even judges. 
probably not a good idea, but has been proposed. Right? So, in this world of intelligent machines, humanness is much more valuable than ever before. How do we put the human back inside? That is a key question. Don't be fooled for a second, right? This is not, not just all about connectivity and, and making things work. And I mean, this is, just, this is just what we do now because it isn't working. Once we solve that, then we have to solve this. Right? How do we actually deal with these new powers? Right? In this world, what's happening is quite clear. We have the same cards and we've always had. We're not going to get any more good cards. And that's just who we are. And that is, that is why we are who we are. Because we have those cards. But technology gets a new card every week. So we have to invest as much in humanity as we invest in technology. 90% of my clients are technology companies. When they talk about this, they're realizing, first, I don't want to be responsible for anything. That's like Facebook saying, we're not a media company, but they are, in fact, the leading media company in the world. Well, that's a pretty lame excuse. That's something we should think about. We're going to need new skills, and if you have kids, you should print this out and put it on the wall. 2015, World Economic Forum, and this is 2020, right? Critical thinking, creativity, emotional intelligence, cognitive flexibility. What kind of skills are those? Well, they are obviously not logical skills. Does it mean we don't need logical skills? Of course not. I mean, it would be great if you could be a scientist and a humanist. But what will I, will I kids be safe because they can program HTML? A machine can program HTML. Will our kids be safe because they're data scientists? Probably. Yeah. But then we have to think about what that means, right? So we have this door opening up in our, uh, in our world as to what's important, and I call that sometimes the EQ and the IQ, right? We're going to need a lot more EQ, the emotional quotient. Combine that with our intellectual powers. Yeah. And I think for our businesses, it's very important that uh, I think being on Team Human is a key differentiator. Even if you make robots, you can be on Team Human. Right? Team Human means, first and foremost, do this for collective human benefit. You don't do it just because it will make a lot of money. And I tell you one thing, the business of replacing humanity is a huge business. Very tempting. So that's something to keep in mind. I'll give you uh, three more bullets and then we'll have some questions. The Future of Life Institute, uh, supported by Elon Musk, came up with a bunch of principles for technology, for the future of technology, mostly about AI. But these are great principles. First, everything we invent has to have human values. That's the purpose of why we're inventing stuff. So it has to be compatible with, with dignity, rights, freedoms, cultural diversity. It has to have shared benefit and prosperity, which may mean that we have to give it away that it blows apart this idea of selling everything just because somebody can afford it. We have to think of an ecosystem. You know, the biggest reason for terrorism is uh, inequality. Right? And we have increased inequality because of technology, unfortunately. That is very true. We don't feel that way because for us, you know, we're not in the same boat with people who would have that feeling. Right? It's very important to think about that, is the ecosystem thinking, and then the responsibility. Those that run and build these things are responsible. Otherwise, we become like the American gun lobby, you know, to where the gun companies say, well, you know, we just make the guns, you know, people kill people, don't, guns don't kill people. I mean, talking about a cheap excuse. Yeah. So, that's something we have to look at, and then I think for the future we have to uninstall our fear of technology also, because Hollywood is teaching us that robots will kill us. That's a very bad public image on the other side of the equation. As the same organization says, keep calm and work on safety. In other words, we shouldn't just say, well, we, we shouldn't do that because robots may get too powerful or so, right? We should do that for the black hole at CERN, maybe. Uh, that could be a slight problem if it went wrong. Um, but here, I think we need to move forward in such a way. My final uh, message from the book is that we must embrace technology, but not become it. 
Now, we have to find a, a way that we can stay human despite or on top of technology. So a better title for my book would have probably been Humanity on Top of Technology. I think that is where we're going, but we have to be wise and we have to have good governance for this. And I think we have to speak up about things that are standing in our way to do that. So I want to thank you for your time. You can download the slides later. Thank you.